say it exactly this way when this woman was brought before him. He said, I forgive you. I restore you. I give you back your dignity and your worth that life has a way of pulling away from you. Now go and sin no more because this is no way to live. And you are better for this. I have much more in store for you. Did you hear what Jesus did? And the story would be told. 
So I tell you all that to deal with that little comment that you see in your text. This in no way impugns the accuracy of the scripture. And it does not mean we cannot draw on this episode as the Bible. So rest easy. This is the inspired word of God. And so we will include it as our sermon text here today. Beginning with chapter with verse 2. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The, do, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. And as was his practice, Jesus went into the temple courts. The reason the word courts is plural is that there were multiple courtyards surrounding the Jewish temple. There was the court of the Gentiles, and it was the farthest away from the center of the temple. There was the court of women, and there was also the court of the people where the Israelites would go and worship. All of these courts were outside the temple building. And so Jesus made a practice of coming in there, and often he would sit somewhere, and a crowd would gather, as they did for any Jewish rabbi who showed up to teach. Most of the people in that day could not read. And so this was their only means of hearing the Word of God. And in the midst of those crowds that were always gathered, the scribes, which is another word for the teachers of the law, and the Pharisees brought in a woman they claimed was caught in the act of adultery. And as a way to trap Jesus between the law and his compassion, they challenged him, what do you want us to do with her? John noted their motivation. They were not concerned about the law. They were not concerned about this woman. They really weren't that much concerned about Jesus. They just wanted to trap him in such a way that they could accuse him of a crime and remove him and eliminate the fuss he was causing. That was their motivation. But then we go on in the second part of verse 6. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And that is a verse that has vexed theologians for thousands of years. Because wouldn't you love to know what he was writing? <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, do you get curious? What was he doing? Is he just doodling in the dirt? Or do you, do you think he was writing something? Nobody knows. John doesn't say. But isn't this a great way to respond to a pompous blowhard? <laughs> just knelt down and started doodling in the dirt and waited. Well, they kept on, it says in verse 7, they kept on questioning him, and he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left, and the woman still standing there. These religious leaders like some religious leaders today, were quite rude. And they were insistent that they be given their place. They had walked into this crowd of people. It'd be like somebody walking in here on Sunday morning in the middle of a sermon and asking a totally unrelated question and standing there demanding an answer. That was the context. They were important men. And they wanted their answer. And Jesus' response is classic and biblical, I might add. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He didn't lay aside her sin. He did not lay aside the fact that adultery is a sin. It's the seventh commandment 
in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's right there. And Jesus, you may recall, said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And so the rule still applies, but his response leaves room for grace. And that's the beauty of our Lord Jesus. And then he went back to writing in the dirt. And whether it was because of their own conviction at their own sin, or because they had simply come to understand that they were not going to trap Jesus. The crowd dispersed. And then the scene comes down to Jesus and the woman right there in, in verse 10. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Beautiful, beautiful words. I forgive you. If I could be so bold as to paraphrase Jesus, you're meant for more than this. Now I forgive you of your sin. Go and leave this life and live the one I have given you. So we come down to the three Groups or three individuals that are part of the narrative. We have the guilty, we have the grumpy, and we have the gracious. And we deal first with the guilty. We cannot, we will not, according to Scripture, lay aside the definition of sin that God has given us. And there was, there is no wiggle room in this in that this woman was, in fact, guilty. She had been caught, as it said, in the act of adultery. No need for witnesses. No need for a long trial. She's guilty, and we concede that point. Her sin is right there before everyone. And regardless of anyone's opinion or motivation, God in heaven has given us his definition of sin. Now, we, a lot of people in fact, don't like to talk about God's definition of sin. We somehow think as human beings, we get to have an opinion. We get to go on what we think. Well, that way, I don't think that's sin. Or lay aside that thing. We don't get to do that. God has already defined sin, and he wrote it in stone, literally. He's serious about this, and it has not changed. You know the commandments. You can find them in Exodus 20, as the group that's been studying on Wednesday night knows all too well now, don't you? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make anything an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder, shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, shall not lie, you shall not covet. Now in 2024, I got it right that time, our problem is perhaps we don't take sin seriously enough. But the scripture teaches that all sin falls short of God's glory and that the wage of sin is death. We understand this to be physical death that can lead to spiritual death if we don't come to know Christ as our Savior. And in Romans 3.10 we're told, on the day of judgment, everyone will give an account. And Jesus described this in his wonderful parable of the sheep and the goats. And we love what happens to the sheep. They're the ones that he loves. They're the ones that have repented. They're the ones that know him. They served him on the earth. But what happens to the goats? Well, their portion will be in the lake that burned with fire and sulfur, which is the second or spiritual death. This sin thing is serious business. And just like the woman whose sin was undeniable, you and I, individually, stand guilty in our sin before Jesus. Okay, let's not stay there too long. Let's move on to the grumpy. The grumpy 
is the scribes and the Pharisees. And I don't know about you, but here we stand in 2024, and I've had enough of grumpy religious leaders. How dare you take the gospel, the Christian life, one of the most joyful experiences you have ever had, and make it something else. This is a great way to live, my friends, and it probably never occurred to the scribes and the Pharisees that they were as guilty as the woman that they were bringing before Jesus. See, they considered themselves to be good, and she was guilty because she sinned in a different way than they did. And Scripture does not allow us to rank sin for that very reason. Jesus said if you're guilty of a letter, you're guilty of the whole law. And we don't have the luxury of ranking our sin. I can't stand before you and say, well, I don't do that, so I'm better. Well, I've got my own things that I do, and so do you. And so, <laughs> have you ever noticed how judgmentalism always leaves us grumpy? There are a lot of really ticked off people walking around today <laughs> claiming the name of Christ. And while this woman was guilty, no doubt about it, why did that make them so angry? Why were they so ticked off? And they were ready to invoke the law, and the law did say this was a capital offense. Adultery in the Old Testament was grounds for stoning. That's what the Old Testament describes. However, along comes Jesus, and he talks about this grace. And if you haven't noticed it, grace really infuriates the grumpy. I don't want God to forgive them. They're doing something that offends me. Whether it's sinful or not doesn't enter into the equation. It offends me. It bugs me. I want God to judge them. Therefore, I judge them as well. And Paul came along in Romans 14. And he said, why do you judge your brother or your sister? Why do you treat them with such contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. In other words, if it is the exclusive authority of Jesus Christ to judge, and it is, According to John 5, 2 Timothy 4, 2 Corinthians 5, I could go on and on and on to list the number of times in the New Testament that says Jesus will be the judge at the end of things. And if that's his exclusive place, why do you and I get so bent out of shape when people don't behave the way we think they should? I am not saying sin is okay. Do not hear that. Sin is sin. God has defined that. But I am saying you will never argue anybody into the kingdom. Nobody accepted Jesus as their Savior ever because you walked up to them and said, you're a dirty, rotten sinner and you're going to die and go to hell. <laughs> that is not a good evangelistic strategy. And nowhere in the New Testament did Jesus ever tell us that we in the church are to go out and make the world behave. He never told us that. Really, the only thing he told us was go share the gospel. Go show them what love is. Go show them how a person who is following Jesus lives. Do that and let me do the rest. Judgment is coming. There is a literal hell described as a lake of fire and brimstone. All of that is true. But you and I don't have anything to do with that judgment or that process. We are to pursue Christ and to show his love to everyone around us. So let's not be grumpy. Just like the scribes and the Pharisees, the followers of Jesus are often grumpy because we find ourselves judging the sin of others. Yeah, I know it's sin. And I know it's wrong. But God does not give me or you the place to go point it out and say, that's sin. You need to stop it. Better to show the love of Christ. Finally, we come to the gracious. And that's the part of the story that I love the best because King Jesus was and is gracious to a fault. 
Grace is in there. In that word gracious. When you and I in the 20, uh, 2024 think of gracious, we, we tend to think of good manners. But it goes way past that. Grace is in there. Jesus is gracious. And grace is the most basic characteristic we know about him. Therefore, it is to be the characteristic that you and I show the most because it includes love and compassion and empathy and forgiveness. It's all woven up into grace. And freely we have received, therefore freely we must give. Now, while Jesus didn't say it exactly this way when this woman was brought before him, he said, I forgive you. I restore you. I give you back your dignity and your worth that life has a way of pulling away from you. Now go and sin no more because this is no way to live. And you are better for this. I have much more in store for you. That's what he says to all of us when we come and confess our sin. And so if, if you feel conviction at those words... Hear it from the Holy Spirit, not from the preacher. And confess your sin, not to me, to him. And let him do what he did for this woman. Jesus didn't say, oh, it's going to be okay. No, he told her to go change your life. Go and sin no more. Because Jesus is gracious. He told us things like, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and any burden I give you will be light. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And along the way, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is gracious and he offers us a better way of life. Now I would never presume to stand before you and say, I, here's your sins, go confess them. That, that's not how this operates. That's not how God works. I, we've tried that in the church. Fire and brimstone preachers and over the years, and I confess, I've, I've preached a fire and brimstone sermon a couple of times in my life. But no one came to know Jesus through it. You come to know Jesus when you come to accept the fact that he loves you. And that you need him. And that you are a sinner like all the rest of us. When I say you're a sinner, I'm included in that category. And he offers grace. Grace, as the song says, that is greater than all my sin. Yes, we are all grumpy from time to time. Let's just acknowledge that. But let's stop being grumpy. Because we're followers of Jesus Christ and he is gracious Gracious to us and gracious to anyone who would receive him as Savior. So, deal today with your guilt. That's between you and God. With the Holy Spirit to lead you according to the biblical definition that he has given. Do you have sin in your life that you need to deal with? Well, don't be grumpy. Don't lash out at others and try to get them to behave when... Let's face it, you and I are not behaving ourselves either. And anybody in the room is perfect, you're excused. You can go from this place and go in peace. <laughs> and always, always, always remember the graciousness of our Lord Jesus as he has given us forgiveness for sin and a guide to take us through life and a mission to show his love to others. <laughs>